Well, friends in Christ, I had a classmate. His name was, was Brian. And Brian fulfilled the role of the class disruptor. Every class seems to need one. And he fulfilled the role of a class disruptor by his wit and by his intelligence. But just by the title of class disruptor, you know what that means. He would exhibit these great traits at inappropriate places and inappropriate times. We could get the class laughing, but at the same time it was behavior that was disrespectful to the class as well as to the teacher. Now, Brian carried that attitude over to confirmation class. And we had a confirmation class where my dad instructed, and he had a lay person to help him. He split it up in two 30-minute segments. Mr. Flage, a fifth-grade public school teacher, taught one half of it, and then he would teach the other half, flipping back and forth between seventh and eighth grade classes. And Brian was his normal self with Mr. Flage. I mean, he was disrupting, he was disrespectful, and unfortunately, Mr. Flage, even though he was a public school teacher, couldn't do anything to discipline Brian. There was no class he could send him to, another room. There was no principal's office he could be sent to. There was just really no way to discipline him. Sure, yeah, he could have talked to the parents, but the parents, since Brian's now 13 years old, probably have the same kind of reaction, which would be just a shrug of shoulders. Boys are going to be boys. But then when the switch took place, when my father entered the room, Brian stood up at attention, never disrupted the class once. And I had to ask Brian, I said, Brian, why do you pay attention to when my dad is teaching? He said, you ever seen your daddy scary? <laughs> Brian stood at attention because he said he was afraid of my father. My father looked stern and maybe a little bit gruff. And I never really saw my dad in that light. My dad was, yeah, fair and just. He justly punished us when we'd done wrong, but he also was a loving and forgiving father. It was the first time I kind of saw my father at a, at a different angle. But as I began to think about it this week, I think what really was the difference is that Brian didn't necessarily be scared of my father, but my dad, when he walked into the room, he had this commanding presence that filled the room that just made you stand at attention to hear what he had to say. He had a voice of authority about the issues he was sharing with the class. It was something you didn't want to miss. And when we want to talk about a commanding presence this morning, you cannot find another one greater than, in man than John the Baptist, whose commanding presence did just not fill a room, it filled a desert. When you look at people who have commanding presence, they exhibit certain traits. And you see this in John the Baptist. He was a man of integrity. He never had to say, you know, do as I say, not as I do. His actions were equivalent with his words. He was a man of conviction. He never went back. He never waffled. Jesus, even in his testimony to John the Baptist, when he heard that he was beheaded, talked about the conviction of John when he said what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Expecting an answer to that question of no. John was not a reed shaken by the wind. He was a man who stood up for what he believed and never waffled. He was a man of conviction. His commanding presence filled a desert. And people who have commanding presence show actual concern and compassion for those to whom they visit to those who they instruct. And the way John the Baptist showed his concern and compassion was to call his hearers to repentance, asking them imperatively, commanding them to repent and to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. He was a man of also who his dress exhibited integrity, one who said he was leaving it all for God, preaching in the wilderness and wearing garments of camel hair and eating locusts and wild honey. Jesus, again, gives testimony to this aspect of his integrity, of his commanding presence, when he said, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? 
Again, the answer would be no. You went out to see a man who lived what he preached. He was a man who inspired people. He was so inspirational that the gospel writers say that all of Jerusalem, all of Judea, went out to hear him, went out to be baptized by him. John had this uncanny ability of bringing you into the presence of God by his preaching. And that is what everybody wants. And that's what everybody doesn't want. For you see, when these people were in the presence of God to the word of John the Baptist, they had Isaiah moments of fear and trembling. When Isaiah found himself in the presence of God, he had these things to say and confess. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. God's holiness just has a way of doing this when he comes into the presence of sinners. These people, when John preached, when they believed they were now in the presence of God, were not confessing they were people of just unclean lips. They were people of unclean hearts. They feared and they trembled, but they walked away in peace because John didn't leave them hanging. He didn't tell them that they were sinners with no hope. He told them they were sinners with hope through the baptism of repentance. They went away knowing that God was at peace with them through forgiveness that was coming in the name of Jesus Christ. The message of John the Baptist was so inspirational, it was almost like a bandwagon thing. You can imagine people going back home and saying it was a badge of honor to be baptized by John the Baptist. And everybody, all of Jerusalem and all Judea was going out to be baptized by John. And like if you weren't, there might be something wrong with you. And so we see Pharisees and Sadducees jumping on the bandwagon. But they don't even know what this bandwagon is all about. They don't get it. They want to be kind of one with the crowd and have that badge of honor of being baptized by John the Baptist. And so they come. But John the Baptist is a prophet. He sees in their hearts. And he tells them, you guys don't have the right understanding of this action. You're coming just to get this thing to say you were baptized by me, but you don't understand what it means because you're not coming with the right attitude. And so he calls them a brood of vipers. Who told you to flee from the coming wrath of God? And don't even begin to say to yourself that you deserve this act of baptism because we're children of Abraham. I tell you right now that God can even produce from these stones children of Abraham. Get your act together. Understand what's happening here. If you see the first and the Sadducees walked around like saying they weren't sinful. They did baptisms before, and it was just kind of a simple ceremonial washing. And what's the difference between the washings they were doing in their city and the washing that John was doing? The difference was huge. It was more than just getting dirt off the body. It was getting dirt off the soul, getting dirt off the heart. And they weren't understanding that. They weren't understanding that if they're going to come to this sacrament with John, they need to come with repentance. Because you know what? You can't get forgiveness without first experiencing repentance. And you can't experience repentance without first acknowledging you're a sinner. Many of the Pharisees and Sadducees were not baptized by John because they would not lower themselves to the acknowledgement that they were sinful people that God was good with them just because of their birthright. But some did, but many, of course, from what the Scripture says, did not. And so what does all this really have to do with Christmas, and why do we have this reading of John the Baptist every year, second Sunday of Advent? Because we want to keep in mind what this season of Advent, not Christmas, what this season of Advent is all about. 
The church wants you to remember what this season and what you are before God. That's why these readings are here. So yes, celebrate your Christmas. Celebrate the first coming of Christ with great joy, unmitigated joy. Celebrate with festive decorations. Celebrate with gift giving and gift receiving. Celebrate with sharing the joy of Christmas through caroling and other things that we do during the Christmas season and bring joys to the life of people. Celebrate with joy the first visit of Christ, that he has come to redeem his people. Redemption which he accomplished on that cross of Calvary through his death and resurrection. Celebrate with joy about his first coming. But keep in mindful of this, let us also celebrate his second coming with repentance. He's coming back, people. Despite being not returned for 2,000 years, the faith of the Christian is Jesus is coming back. And in this visit, he's going to bring restoration, fulfillment. And as we are waiting for this fulfillment, the church gives us these readings to make us sure that we are not yet complete. We still are sinners living in the presence of a holy God. And so during the season of Advent, we're going to have kind of mixed emotions. When we come to the Lord's table, we're going to have kind of mixed emotions. We're going to have the Isaiah moment of fear and trembling because the sin is still within us. And so it's really not wrong for us to come to the Lord's table and say, Woe is me, for I'm a man of un I am a man undone. I'm a man just not of unclean lips, but unclean hearts before this holy God who visits me in his word and his sacrament. Yes, during the season of Advent, because of our sinfulness, it's proper to experience fear when God visits us. But also, we can have the same moment of peace and joy of knowing that because of what Christ has done for us, this sacrament here gives us peace with God and forgiveness of sins. And so like the people who came to the river of Jordan to be baptized by John, they come in fear and trembling, but they leave in peace and comfort. I pray that's your experience. That when you come not to the river Jordan, but when you come to the river of the Christ's body and blood, you come with a little fear and trembling, but you walk away in peace and comfort, knowing that your sins have been forgiven. You come to the rail acknowledging, O oh Lord, you who can make children of Abraham out of stones, make this sinner a saint. And he does. Brian never really understood my father. He never really other side, saw the other side of my father. I'm sure that if he would have spent more time with my dad, he would see him a little bit more in the same light as I did. But you see, that's where Jesus Christ comes into play for us. Is he's not only a redeemer, but he's also a revealer. He reveals to us what our father is like. Our father is just, and he will justly punish sin. But our Heavenly Father is also loving and forgiving and forgives those sins to the blood of his Son. And it is this news, this good news of the gospel that gives us peace and comfort when you walk away from his holy presence today. And a day will come when all things are restored where we'll have the same unmitigated joy that King David had. No more fear, only joy. David says about being in the presence of Lord, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. One day, that'll be our experience too. In his name, amen.